Now, just a little warning before we begin, there's going to be some major spoilers in this video for the fourth episode of Season 3 of The Bad Batch. So if you haven't seen it yet and you're planning to watch it and you don't want anything ruined, it is a really good time to click away. Okay, so after a very strong three-episode premiere last week, we got a, uh, I guess a pretty decent follow-up episode this week. No, it wasn't exactly the best episode the show has ever delivered, though it certainly has its high points, especially the ending, which we'll talk about in a few. But overall, it just basically felt like a... It kind of felt like a return to formula, let's say. It was the standard sort of Bad Batch episode where they get to a planet, they encounter a problem or complications with whatever they're trying to accomplish, there's then some sort of battle towards the end, and then they get away and it's all done in just under 25 minutes. Though that said, yes, it was nice that this time it was Crosshair and Omega. That was certainly a new twist on the old formula, shall we say? And they are kind of this odd couple, or they're these two opposites when it comes to, well, when it comes to pretty much everything about them, including their attitudes and the way they approach situations or how they want to try and resolve them, which is really what the episode was all about and did well. It showed the contrast between these two characters and how, sure, they could learn a thing or two from each other, they could make a pretty decent team and get the job done when they had to. We also see that Omega absolutely refuses to pretty much ever leave anyone behind. She's even talking about going back to free all the clones that are still imprisoned at Mount Tantis, which makes me wonder more and more about seeing a clone uprising or rebellion at some point in the season and what the most likely tragic results of that will be. We do know that there aren't, uh, there aren't too many clones left around down the road, and the few that we have seen so far outside of Rex, Wolf, and Gregor in Rebels well, they aren't exactly doing so well. Anyway, Omega, of course, refuses to leave without Batcher, even though they have the credits needed to get off planet now. She wins them at gambling in the episode, which, yes, it kind of ties back to her time at SIDS, where she learned a thing or two about gambling and uh, was uh, quite good at it, apparently. But, as I said, she's not going to leave without Batcher, who's been taken by the Empire, and they're, um, shipping her away along with a bunch of other animals they've collected, I guess. I don't know why they're doing this, maybe, or probably, it's part of the, uh, experiments we've not only heard about, but seen the results of, like with the mutated Sarlacc pit-like creature that was in last week's episodes. We also, for the sequel trilogy fans out there, I think we got a glimpse of a Rathtar at one point, or some tentacles of a Rathtar. Pretty sure that's what snatched up the fat, pompous Imperial Captain towards the end of the episode there. But anyway, yeah, Omega refuses to leave without her new friend and pet, again showing her dedication, and despite Crosshair saying they should uh, leave her behind. Though he eventually goes along with the idea to rescue her because I think he, I think Crosshair kind of realizes that Omega's refusal to leave anyone behind is the reason he is free and here now. If not for her dedication to others, he'd still be rotting away in Tantus. And it's then at this point in the episode, during the rescue when things start to go south, that Omega finally decides to give the Crosshair way a try, the uh, more direct approach, let's say. The let's kill a bunch of them and not worry so much about the details and we'll figure it out as we go approach, which is ultimately successful and they steal the ship and send out a signal to Wrecker and Hunter to meet up with them. And I think that makes perfect sense that Omega would of course know some type of emergency way to contact them. After all, she memorized every single one of their plans and certainly one of the first things Hunter would have taught her if it's not just one of the plans is how to contact them should they ever be separated. Not to mention Crosshair in the previous season knew how to send a signal out to them as well. This all then culminates with, or ends with, I gotta admit it, it's a pretty emotional reunion here. And sure, maybe you could have prolonged it a bit or drawn this whole thing out a bit more over a couple more episodes. Maybe you throw some more complications into the mix first instead of just reuniting them like this. But then you'd probably just end up with more episodes like this one where they, again, get to a planet, encounter some problems, and figure it all out and get away in roughly 25 minutes or less. And, like I said, I think the emotional impact was still there, especially after last week's episodes, or the first episode in particular, where they really kind of slowed down the pace and let you understand how long these two groups, or how long Omega has been away from the rest of them. And so, yes, it did get me in the feels to see Hunter reunited with Omega, and Wrecker too, though Hunter, I think, pits a little harder for obvious reasons. That is the more father figure, where Wrecker is the fun uncle. 
And somehow I just knew they would save the crosshair part of the reunion for next week. I knew they'd leave it off there and make us wonder for a week how this was going to play out. Will they, will Crosshair's brothers forgive him just like that? Or will it, and I think this is more likely the case, will it take some time before they can trust him again or fully trust him again? And certainly there are going to be some bumps in the road when it comes to repairing this relationship. Beyond that, though, honestly, there's really not a whole lot to say about the rest of the episode. We got a little bit on Tantus with Nala Say and Dr. Hemlock, where we didn't exactly learn anything new about, well, pretty much anything, or what's the deal with Omega. We have it reiterated that, yes, her blood, for some reason, it accepted the M-count transfusion, and that Nala say has been hiding that all along. But we don't know if that's just somehow dumb luck that Omega's blood is special or if it has something to do with the reason why she was created in the first place. Assuming there is a reason why she was created beyond just, you know, wanting a female Django Fett clone or two. And yes, I am guessing or assuming there is absolutely a reason she was as well as Emery were created and we will learn that by season's end. And that, for better or worse, it'll obviously or most likely have something to do or some part to play in Palpatine somehow returning one day. Now, how directly of a role will this all play is a very good question. We do have a book, Shadow of the Sith, that begins to touch on some of this, some of the details of his return. It even tells us exactly who Rey's parents were, for example, with Rey's father, Dathan, actually being a clone of Palpatine a failed one essentially, or a failed one from Palpatine's perspective, that didn't have force powers or a high enough M count to be a suitable host for Palpatine. Now, could it be that the book, or what we know from it, will be changed to some degree, or maybe just retconned entirely, and somehow, I don't know, somehow Omega will actually play a big part in the lineage of Rey? And I know it's a joke or a meme at this point that everyone has been a suspect, or was at one point, a suspect to be Rey's mother or somehow related to her, but could that possibly be where they're going with all this? Or something like that? Could actually Omega be Rey's mother or grandmother or something? Or somehow a clone of her? Or who the hell knows where they'll go with it? I suppose only time will tell what her being able to accept M-count transfusions will amount to in the greater story. Though speaking of M-Counts, I do wonder why they keep calling it M-Count. I find it curious that they won't just say midi-chlorians. Do they think fans don't realize they're one and the same? Do they honestly think some will have painful prequel memories if they hear the words midi-chlorians again? I mean, I kind of get that in The Mandalorian you don't want to say midi-chlorian because that show is far more mainstream, you could say. And you, um, you might fool casual fans who didn't like midi-chlorians back in the day by saying M-count instead. They might somehow not realize they're the same thing. But if you, for whatever reason, if you had a big problem with midi-chlorians back in the day, or you still do, if they ruined the prequels or Star Wars for you, well then I highly doubt you're sitting here today watching The Bad Batch. In other words, just say midi-chlorians already. It's alright, I think we can all handle it, and we know what you're talking about anyway, so, just do it. Alright, so again, kind of wrapping this up, maybe not a ton happened, and maybe it wasn't the greatest episode ever, especially in the wake of three excellent or premiere episodes last week, but it did have its moments, and I didn't mind seeing Omega and Crosshair have to work together some more. Her sort of vouching for him will likely play a big role in the rest of the Bad Batch, kind of accepting him back into the fold. I also appreciate the fact that even if, yes, it did use a very tried and true formula at this point for this show, it still, for the most part, felt like it stayed on target and like this was just a natural progression of the story, right? Not like an intentional one-off to kill some time like has been done in seasons past. And that has had a way of maybe kind of killing the momentum of the show at times, especially after picking up after maybe a couple really good episodes in a row. And if we could right away just go to the next episode instead of having to wait a week for the reunion with Crosshair, though honestly I don't mind this being a week-to-week -week show instead of dropping all at once, I'm, I'm fine with that. But if we could just get to the next part of the story right away, the part that I think is going to be pretty interesting, I think it would have had even less of a problem with this episode than I already do, if that makes sense. So again, a solid episode that plays its part in the overall story, but certainly not the best episode we've ever got from this series.
Well, that's all I got for you this time. Now it is your turn to take to the comments below and tell me what you thought of this latest episode of The Bad Batch. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Did you fall somewhere in between? And why? And so whatever you think, leave those comments below and let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.